Hello and uh, welcome back to the ArtsLink Assembly 2023. Um, I'm very happy that we have a lot of leading artists, but also great friends and colleagues uh, joining us. Um, so we're going to now go into a, a bigger conversation around the document. Uh, and I'll hand over directly to Hanat, uh, who I think is with us already. Uh, Hanat, are you there? Yes, Simon. Hi, a pleasure to hear from you and to see you. Thank you. So thank you for moderating this. I know you also have perspectives on the document. So I'm I'm very happy uh, you, you uh, take over from here. Yeah, thanks. I think I'll set up the discussion at the beginning. So I'll maybe speak for a couple of minutes and later I'll be quiet because there are three more people that I'm personally more interested to hear than myself. So today we are talking about Beyond Green and Grass and the strategies toward the Ukrainian transitional cultural reconstruction. And I'm here with Aleftina Kahidze, prominent, prominent Ukrainian artist, uh, my big friend and an ArtsLink alum. Uh, I'm also, jo we are also joined by Katerina Limova, co-founder of the culture and educational platform Kyiv Contemporary Music Days. Happy to see you. And Anton Ovchinnikov, artist, organizer, and let me say it, an inspiring leader in the contemporary dance field. And as far as I know, also an ArtsLink alum, right? Yes. Uh, we will also be joined in progress by Volodymyr Yermolenko, a uh, writer and philosopher. He'll jump in in the middle uh, out of nowhere. So please be prepared that he'll join us. And my name is Hnat Zabrodsky. I am a curator and also uh, an actor in the field of culture, representing Moka and Joe and the future Azwing International Fellow. Hey. So uh, I'm going to just just couple of sentences you know we are talking about this greener grass and uh when i thought saw this title i immediately thought about this one gog picture uh you know this uh, patch of grass and i just googled it to remind myself of it and the fun fact i didn't know is that uh under the canvas of this painting there was another one and i thought that it's quite an interesting metaphor for what we are going to do here because uh, there was a lot done by Ukrainian cult cultural actors and institution uh, with the full-scale invasion of Russia. However, we still need to do more and build up on that. So maybe within this document that we have and with this discussion, discussion we will offer some great perspectives on what we can do more. Uh, one final thing, uh, Ukrainians and especially Ukrainian artists that we have here, are like synonymous to the word freedom. So we want to have this discussion fluent. However, I can I ask my panelists to fit within the four or five minute mark per question. I think we'll go like three or four rounds so we can hear everything and have some time for the Q&A. So uh, I guess without any further ado, uh, the first thing I want to address is, you know, Tatiana, Anastasia and Elena have like given us this in-depth look into the strategy. However, uh, I guess we might address the purpose of it. So it's like strengthening the, strengthening the ties uh, under the circumstances between A, the Ukrainian institution and for Is he from? Is he uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I'm here. Sorry that some, sometimes I lose it. However, oh, no. He's, um... we lost the question. Because they don't have an air rate. Producing everybody. Well, I'm just I'm checking. Yeah. They have an air rate, but they don't have air. Rate. Hey, sorry, you lost me. Mm -hmm. 
Hey guys, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so Alethina, I'd like you to offer the you, you to be the first one to offer your perspective on this document and the uh, you know the purpose of it. Can you do that please? Uh, you're muted. Okay. Hi. Uh, first of all, I just, you don't mind, uh, just will say one sentence, how it was great, the Zelenisha we had. Really, really, it was amazing that it happened. Sometimes I realized that I haven't seen the people from my sphere almost for a year. This is very important to say. And I'm so happy that we are discussing the time and also it's connected. Thank you so much. So the document I just looked, uh, I would say that I would uh, maybe talk so much about that many problems were very honestly uh, told by the people which were interviewed, who were interviewed. They were so much connected to education. This is how I feel. Let me explain why I think like this. When um, interviewed people were talking about miscommunication or for instance, that institution didn't install some connections with them for long-term collaboration, it was some complaints or something like this. It's so much about what I mean, education, because uh, education means also so much about social skills, so much about how market structured, so much about how international institutions do work. And when I was reading this report, Many times I actually notice myself, can I tell you this, that I'm in such privileged position because I haven't had these problems, be honest. And I actually answered myself mostly because I had education abroad and I also had many, many years of experience working with international institutions. And since uh, I noticed this, if to talk about solutions, Looking at this report, which is absolutely important paper, my answer would be more educational projects would be installed for Ukrainian artists. I would be happy in the list. So this one of uh, my commentary. Not maybe just let tell me more what I have to be more short or longer. Yeah, yeah. I'm a bit. Uh, yes, I. That's just a kickoff question. And I'll definitely kindly ask you to further to address the issue of the education. As far as I know, you have a lot of perspective on that. Here, I'd maybe kindly ask Katerina, uh, reading through this document, and maybe uh, can you offer your perspective, especially on this aspect of artists working abroad and artists staying here and regarding uh, how important You were muted. <laughs> no, I was not. Sorry, I'm the best hotel in the city. However, the Wi-Fi is struggling. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so probably I missed the last yeah, sorry part for of the that. sentence, uh, but I yeah, tried to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Katrina. Yeah, and I'd ask you to comment on the importance of ties between Ukrainian artists abroad and Ukrainian artists in here. Why is that important? What is your perspective on that? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so yes, actually, uh, like a year ago on the previous assembly, uh, we uh, I was a speaker and also a participant, uh, and in our uh, personal conversation with organizers and with uh, participants as well, we discuss the importance of creating such a document. And actually, it was a pleasure to see uh, these ideas realized. 
uh, and realize in so wonderful way. Uh, for instance, we also participate in uh, strategic discussion with Alektina and other participants as well. So it's really nice documents that structure it, uh, that uh, formalize, that uh, implement in very easy way to, to understand and go through it. And I believe that uh, it's also an important step, not only because it captures the thoughts of uh, previous assembly participants, but also because, uh, and definitely the interviews, uh, but also because it shows this path, this movement uh, that provide us a foundation with which we could uh, work further. Um, I think uh, that... Uh, it's uh, important uh, to definitely, uh, it's obvious to important to uh, establish and maintain all this connection between Ukrainians uh, and international organization between Ukrainians within in Ukraine and outside the Ukraine. Uh, and it's always uh, has been essential. Uh, I, I may say that uh, during uh, my work experience, uh, this question usually uh, erased, uh, but uh, I think that uh, the war actually highlighted this need uh, because more people now involved in these processes and we need to develop this effective strategy uh, in these circumstances. And I actually highlight from the document three main points. Uh, it's definitely that uh, the main point it's international awareness and advocacy so which means that we could cooperate with people uh with ukrainians who are um, now not in ukraine uh, as a people who could bring uh, our narrative for bigger audience uh and it I, I don't see why not we, we should do that so that's the main idea what we uh, need to uh keep this connection as much as possible. Uh, the other part is actually support and developing of this support. I mean, in the um, in culture sector, we probably all have and share the common goals. Uh, and I think that we could be more effective uh, if we would have the direct uh, direct actions. And in this case, yeah, there's the support of uh, People from Ukraine and, and who live now in Ukraine, who live now abroad, it could be, uh, you know, the mm, the valuable uh, mm, position and uh, idea. And I also may say it's probably maybe quite a pragmatic way, but we all uh, have in the common goal, we also have the same uh, resources. And if we connect together, we could be uh, could easily reach such resources and experience and share this experience also among our uh, these categories, and the third probably the last one is a professional development. It somehow also reflect what uh, Alexina just had uh, that um, this cooperation uh, and this connection could also bring us the. Um, the prompt uh, education, maybe I could be um, not fully agree with that because I, I do not really believe that we could do that very fast in case uh, in realm of uh, higher education. But I really believe that uh, this experience that Ukrainians who uh, live abroad now, who work in international organization and with international in institution actually could uh, bring knowledge and could share that uh, and could share their experience as well. So I think this I three, yeah, these three points from the document that I could uh, truly support and see very relevant in, 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 in our reality right now. Thank you so much. I think I'll kindly ask you further to address them in more details within our discussion. I also see that Volodymyr has joined us. However, first of all, First, I'd like to offer Anton uh, the word, the intro word, and Anton, uh, as the organizer, you know, that's, that's how you're mentioned in this ArtsLink promo, I'd kindly offer you, ask you to offer the perspective on 
uh, how valuable it is to build this cooperation between uh, Ukrainian institutions, Ukrainian artists, and foreign institutions and artists? And what is your personal experience with the start of the full-scale war? Uh, thank you, Vlad. Uh, uh, I, I read the document with uh, the, that, that resonate, resonated with me very much. It's really very well structured and the ideas that was presented there and that was discussed and I, I unfortunately I, I I didn't didn't and haven't been presented at the conference at the greener grass but this document is really uh, very much overlapping with uh, my ideas and what I think about this um, strengthening ties this idea of strengthening ties between the culture and art uh, activists or artists in Ukraine and abroad. And uh, all of my, in, in my field, I can only take from my, uh, say from my own experience in the performing arts and especially in the dance field, that's, uh, that's I absolutely sure that the exchange between professionals and professional organizations in Ukraine. There are not so many of them in the dance field, but between professionals in Ukraine and professionals and abroad, that's an extremely important thing. That's absolutely the critical thing because uh, there's the situation in, I'm not so much in, in general in performing arts, but in dance is very specific in Ukraine. It's a, I don't know, I know why, but it's kind of isolated from the European context. It's very much different. And uh, yes, and I think the most important what what's going on now and which can be can have the quite a big impact on the further development of the professional community is the professional development abroad for the choreographers who have this possibility for different reasons now and uh, networking and uh, education of course this is the three uh, main points and uh, um, yeah let's say the deta in details uh, later thank you it's uh, interesting that all three of the participants have, have outlined, you know, this like three main streams and they all interact between your three answers. And now we have Volodymyr with this uh, impromptu intervention. So Volodymyr, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. Hello, colleagues. Uh, yes, this is a very improvised, uh, um, uh, improvised my participation. Maybe you can precise what I should talk about and what you're interested in most. Volodymyr, I think it will be very valuable, you know, to you as a philosopher, we, we have even this written, a philosopher and a writer, of course, and we all know your books. How do you, you know, evaluate and uh, what is your perspective on what's going on with the cultural field? How is it reacting to these current challenges of the full-scale invasion? And what are the key steps maybe that we as a country and we as a cultural actors and institution need to take uh, maybe working with the clear narratives for Ukraine? And maybe you can offer your perspective on uh, this issue of working with Russian artists so uh, where, wherever your knowledge and experience takes us, it will be interesting for us. We are uh, just offer your perspective. Okay. Uh, so the first thing I would like to say that is that uh, now we are, this week is, is the week of empty chairs in uh, Pan International. Maybe you know about this. And... Uh, I mean, when we are talking about the war, uh, obviously we should talk about real people. And let me just uh, share, uh, can I share this screen maybe? I think we'll kindly ask Mia if we can do that. Mia, can we do that? Yes, I've just made you co-host, uh, so you should be able to. I will just, uh, okay, great, great.
no, somehow it's not working, but anyway, uh, so we have uh, a map uh, at Pan Ukraine, which just shows uh, the names of the artists, which are no longer with us, which have been killed during the war. And uh, you can see that the 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 names, just the names of these artists is, is already a big, big story. So it, we're talking about at least 70 plus artists who have been killed either on the front line or um, or uh, in the homes as civilians. And we are talking about over 60 journalists uh, who have been killed again, either during performing their duties or um, on the on the front line. This empty chair week, uh, I'm now traveling across Europe. We have uh, made a, an event tribute to the memory of Victoria Amelina, Ukrainian writer in Paris and Barcelona. I've just returned from Barcelona. And it actually shows uh, these are very, you know, touchy events and uh, very humane events. But at the same time, we, we're trying to, you know, portray certain names, of course, which are more visible. But we should also remember uh, how many other people are no longer with us. And I think it is important when we think about culture, just think in terms of very concrete names who are no longer are capable of of doing art, of doing science, of doing literature. And to think what we do with, with these people, how we remember them. Uh, in this map, which I which I cannot share, unfortunately, but there are some people who are who, whom I knew, for example, or uh, who are uh, our colleagues or who are um, the friends of our friends. And I, I think this is one, one of the tasks we, sh we should think about, how uh, to continue their voices even after their death. For example, recently published a, uh, a journal, uh, the, the diaries of Vladimir Vakulenko, Ukrainian writer killed by the Russians um, near Izum in Kapitolivka. We are in close relations with, with his family and this uh, very mystical and uh, direct connection between Victoria Melina and Vladimir Vakulenko because Victoria wrote, wrote the preface to these diaries and she died on the day of his birthday. But uh, when you look at uh, at the diaries, which were, you probably know the story, which he dug in the, in the earth, in the land near his house and then Victoria succeeded to, um, to find it, uh, well, this is a very big document uh, of of Russian war crimes and uh, Russian invasion made by uh, a writer who is no longer alive. Uh, I was, uh, during this empty chair week, I was um, posting an image by Denis Krivy, a Ukrainian photographer uh, who passed away, who was killed um, on the 11th of May this year. And uh, I was posting um, a, a photograph of birds that he made uh, in his surroundings. His, he was living in uh, Mykolaivshina, and that is a fantastic um, natural park with, with fantastic nature. And uh, we also are trying to, you know, to remind the, the Ukrainian public and international public about him and about his works. Uh, so I do think that uh, this task is is very important when we talk about culture, you know, to to give a voice to those who are no longer can uh, can say uh, for themselves and to continue their their works. I was so happy to see, for example, in Barcelona the Spanish translation of Victoria's novel, uh, which uh, which which uh, has been recently published, and. Um, I know that uh, she was she was writing a book of nonfiction, um, looking at women, looking at war, which is going to be published in English, and um, I think we need to we need to do that. Also, during the empty chair week, we remind about Maxim Budkevich, who is now uh, a prominent Ukrainian human rights defender, whose location is now unknown. You probably know that he he was giving. 13 years of prison in so-called Luhansk uh, uh, LNR. And uh, the recent news are very worrying because the correspondence to him uh, 
is is not allowed so he is just put the stamp correspondence not allowed and the parents cannot reach him and lawyers cannot reach him and etc so we, we really need to to talk about this um and uh, despite all the helplessness that we have but we ne really need to say that look we are inside the new gulag system we are inside the new stalinism and uh and this is what our cultural figures are going through uh, I'm sure that uh, all all colleagues, all my colleagues, and present here, uh, we uh, sh share this 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 view. Um, we also, I think, we need to raise awareness of really this genocidal element of uh, Russian uh, attacks against Ukrainian culture. You know, recently, uh, just a few weeks ago, we we have been to Kherson. We have been several times to Kherson, and uh, we visited both these robbed museums, the uh, art museum where about 10,000 uh, objects of arts have been stolen by the Russians, and local history museum, where uh, which had about 100, I think, up, up to 200,000 objects. And uh, when you enter it, you realize that actually Russians are stealing the um the the ukrainian identity because there is a hole for example in the local history museum kraisnavchi museum here so there is a whole uh, concentrate uh, devoted to uh, to olvia right and uh, objects archaeological objects which uh, which were there there is a hole devoted to skithian art to skithian gold and, and silver they were robbed by the russians there is a there is a whole devoted to the ancient greek colonies in the in the northern black sea and there is nothing nothing left so we can imagine how russians will present all these objects as you know part of their history not the ukrainian history and then say but look ukraine didn't exist doesn't have any history so these are parts of these elements and i think there is a real need to you know when we talk about international cooperation uh to to really maintain this issue and draw attention to this issue. We also at Penn Ukraine visit lots of destroyed libraries, damaged libraries. There is over 600 damaged or destroyed libraries. And you know, for me as a book writer, it is especially painful to see just, um, just these places which used to be libraries and uh, which now have burnt books and sometimes just ashes instead of the books. Uh, or books just covered by by stones uh, after destruction. We also know the stories how Russians, when they are when they when they are long, when when there is a long time of, of their occupation, how they confiscate Ukrainian books and and uh, say this is extremist books and nationalist or Nazi books and and proceed to their destruction. But also recently, uh, you've seen in the news. A library in Kherson, the uh, regional library of Oles Vanchar, which we visited in December, which was already damaged, severely damaged by the Russians, is now completely destroyed. Uh, you know, it's a library on the on the bank of the Dnieper River, um, itself in a dangerous place. Russians are on the other side of the river, but now it's just, uh, you know, uh, burned down and one, one of the biggest library in, in, in these regions. We also can talk about, well, I've talked a little bit about museums, but uh, you all know that there are so many other stories and museum in Ivankiv and museum in Skovoroda and Skovorodinivka, which we also visited. So this is the, the, bad, the bad side, the tragic side of the story. It's just, you know, some elements, of course, not, not everything. Um, the, Maybe uh, if we go to, to the brighter side for a moment, just with this rainy weather maybe we can focus on just just to offer what we can do more and what are like the good things we can have here yeah so the the good side well i'm i'm, I'm feeling you know like a like a character of monty python always go to the bright side of life you, you know what i mean i hope so um uh, I do think, as I represent the the community of 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 writers of people who are dealing with words, uh, I do think that we have an incredible revival of uh, of literature now, which I think has passed through 
uh, a very hard and difficult period of silence in the first days, in the first months of the invasion, when lots of my my French writers, philosophers were saying, look, I cannot write anymore, I cannot write anything. But then it appears that somehow the silence, I think, was either overcome or, um, or kind of a communicated with, I don't know in which way. And I do think that we have uh, a, a great poetry right now in Ukraine. I, I, many, many contemporary poets are really doing a fantastic job and really writing an incredible poetry. And I do think what is happening of this, quite often we see the anthologies of the Ukrainian poetry uh, published in different languages. I do think it's a good thing because um, in a situation when, for example, uh, you lack translators and uh, you lack a capacity to translate some big things, probably it's a good idea to start with an anthology of poetry, uh, which is at some moment, at some points are more difficult to translate at some other points, depending on the verse, um, le uh, less difficult to translate, etc. And we see, for example, that um, there was a recent publication of uh, Vasily Stu's poetry made by uh, Georges Niva. So Georges Niva is a well-known Slavicist from Geneva, but he spent the majority of his time in translating Russian literature. And now with these people, it's important to work, you know, to to encourage them to learn Ukrainian and to work with the Ukrainian literature. And this is what they're gradually doing. I think this is this is a, an important process. So he translated uh, several hundreds of poems of Stus and it's published in Duhi Litera uh, in Kyiv, but it will also be published, I think, in, in, in Paris, in uh, uh, Flammarion, or if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we recently met uh, people from Gallimard, uh, which is a famous French publishing house, and we saw real will to publish more of the Ukrainian literature. So the, the or Ukrainian history or Ukrainian um, intellectuals, and I think we we really need, need to work with them, you know, to, to make it sustainable. So uh, I do think that in literature, of course, we have fiction, but I think. Poetry and nonfiction are, are very important genres, and we have several very, very strong books of nonfiction, which are, I hope, will also be visible in, uh, in the international market. So what we need to do, we need really to make sus like make sustainable connection between Ukrainian literature and 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 the global global uh, literature and, and publishing market through agents, for example. There are not so many Ukrainian writers who have agents, not so many agents who are interested in, in the Ukrainian literature. So I do think we need to work very systematically with them. The first well, thing is... thank, yes. thank you so much. Yeah, I think we'll we'll just we have we are like have some time frames. So I think we'll have to move on, but I maybe uh would like to follow this speech of yours with uh one thought that I have read in your interview that I've liked. Uh, this that uh, this is the war between the uh, part the Ukraine which has the value of human life as a center and Russia that does not value the human life and uh, the system which values the human lives and does not sacrifice them uh, will definitely will win and set up the rules so uh, within this framework of setting up the rules, I'd ask uh, Katerina. Uh, there is one good thesis I like from this uh, from this document regarding the um, influence of expanding opportunities uh, for networking, establishing partnerships, and the increasing amount of cultural actors representing Ukraine at the international level. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Uh, do you work with a lot of artists who currently represent Ukraine at the international level? And maybe you can expand on that or take any other point from this document and maybe uh, briefly widen it up. 
Well, uh, I'll try. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, actually, uh, I think I could consider myself actually a person uh, who not only stay in Ukraine, but also with a high level of mobility and uh, organizing a contemporary music festival in uh, Lithuania. And actually, do, uh, in, in uh, room of that, I uh, cooperate a lot with Ukrainian musician as well, not only international musician, but also definitely with Ukrainians. And I uh, happy to have this opportunity to present uh, Ukrainian contemporary music uh, in the international field, because um, to, to be honest, when I came at the first time uh, to, to Lithuania, I had a short uh, a short meeting with a uh, director of national uh, radio station and uh, he said we organized uh, a charity concert immediately when the invasion start and he said uh, and I said so what composers you in, involve in this concert he said guess and actually I guess in <laughs> like this because unfortunately uh at the beginning uh, of the invasion, they do not have a lot of options to find uh, whom to invite. So it was like, you know, uh, the names that are uh, well known and not actually really contemporary. Uh, so uh, after that, we organized several um, radio programs with uh, uh, and record uh, mm, uh, contemporary music composers for, for, for in this case. So I, I mean, it's uh, in uh, for networking. Uh, I, I, I'm, uh, I think that the main point of networking is collaboration, uh, actually, and find the opportunity for a joint project where it would be possible to uh, reveal the, all aspects of uh, Ukrainian culture in different fields uh, and uh, try to do that step by step. And I also see this important uh, edit in, uh, in this document that uh, we need to think in a long way uh, because it's really probably not possible to um, to keep this level of interest uh, uh, every time. But what we could do, we could uh, elaborate and collaborate in different uh, projects and to see how to make this project uh, stable and uh, to develop these uh, relations, let's say that really relations with international organization. In this case, we could actually achieve our goal with uh, not only showcase Ukrainian culture, but also to integrate it on their programs, on their uh, curriculum, etc. That's actually a great point. And, you know, we had a discussion with Aleftina one time uh, uh, regarding this, you know, how you transfer a single project into the program. And and I've asked her, uh, how, how did you do that? And uh, Aleftina's answer was that, you know, you have the soft skills. So you not only come, do something and come back, you maybe talk, you en engage yourself in the field. And that brings us to the other issue directly uh, sta stated in these documents is the lack of education and maybe not only professional education, which is clearly a need, but also the broader education for actors in cultural field. Aleftina, can you kindly address on that? Yes, and I just will maybe um, m make more details what I m did mean before about education, because Katerina probably was kind of, oh my God, how it's possible, we are in a war, and then it's like education, it's so complicated, it's ask a lot of time, of course, I understand, but uh, anyway, to come back to the document, I think it's brilliant paper to go through the, when the interviewed people, uh, artists, mainly I find a young artist, do tell something and so many complaints, which is absolutely beautiful. Seems like we've temporarily lost Aleftina, right? 
in the meantime, I'd uh, maybe while we are waiting for Lieutenant to rejoin, I kindly also ask for all the par participants. We are open to your questions, so just maybe type that down in this chat. We'll catch all of them. You can do that uh, personally to either of speakers or just generally, and we'll shuffle it through our panelists. And while we've lost Aleftina, Anton, uh, maybe I'll switch to you because I also have this, uh, you know, the attendance that I like quite much that, uh, oh, I'm Aleftina. Sorry. Yeah, we have you back. Yeah, we I, have know, you I know, back. I was disappeared. <laughs> it's, yeah, uh, we've, we've internet, uh, quite a funny thing. But, but actually, maybe in this paper was missing one thing, just very short remark. Until now, in Ukraine, we don't have very good art state education. And mostly artists who are present, I'm talking about visual art, they're artists who or did visit private schools or had so much about self-education. And this when I was talking about some education projects or platforms, it's really intensive course, which was so skill in Ukraine. One more time, since art education in Ukraine provided by state never was reformed or changed, we have got so many private amazing schools and till now they do work and about uh, um, social skills this is again um, about very good education recently i actually was um, teaching a french international young artist in nunt in france and actually they have a department on uh, um, social skills so there is a person who can help young artists to implement their practices with many different things like accounting, all this financial thing, and also on the communication level, many kind of things. This is so much about education in, in general. And I would say that in Ukraine could be four uh, lessons course or sometimes two months course and it can bring a lot a lot of um, development for young artists i would say all ukrainian And I guess we've lost Aleftina once again, right? Anton, so uh, connections within, there, uh, there is a statement, connections within, within a field are formed through values or research interests. Uh, what do you base your connections in the cultural field? And how do you tighten them up within your field? and how we can broaden those connections. Uh, absolutely agree with that. Alevtina, we'll briefly give a word to Anton and then revert back to you, just a second, thank you. Sorry, sorry, I didn't interrupt you, that just happened. <laughs> yes, I absolutely agree that uh, with what, with what you just said that it's really based on the values, <laughs> first of all. And um, uh, and this, what, what did you say, second, and the, the interest? Yeah, yeah, the research interest, you know. The research interest, yeah. So I, I, I don't actually feel like that we need to broaden this thing, this thing, like to find another thing, another aspects which uh, uh, connect people. Uh, and but I think just that the values can be can be formulated more clear and uh, and discussed with the people who really uh, share the same values. That's what's happened in our field. Like uh, you know, there's a that's not really the separation, but somehow from outside it looks like there's a in a, in a big huge dance and choreography field there's a few uh, there's a two group of people around like 
some um, conceptual thing, you know, one the big group is about the experiment and doing conceptual things and just being passionate about going in unknown. And there's another quite a big uh, group of people who um, organized around the more, you know, like presenting something fabulous, you know, doing something amazing, like uh, presented it to the huge audiences. I'm not talking about commercial things because uh, there, there's a lot of arguments about this, doing commercial, not commercial, what is commercial, what is not. Everybody wants to earn money. But you know, these two things, they, I think they also, also overlapped. I mean, the values and uh, research field. And uh, these two groups are quite big from one point of view and from another point of view, they, the people can exist in both of them. And uh, what, yeah, so I, I don't see that we need uh, other things, which, which when these two is uh, quite important and quite, quite uh, relevant, and they work quite good, at least in the community of contemporary dance artists. And before, thank you, Anton, before we come back to Leftina, I'd maybe also ask Volodymyr uh, to comment regarding this values that can unite the cultural field. And uh, can you add something? What can it be? You know, the research interest, great. Uh, the values, uh, what can we offer more? What can we look into? You mean uh, uh, internationally? Uh, both, you know, internationally, and we have this gap uh, which is broadening each day between the artists that have left Ukraine are temporarily living abroad, and maybe they are losing some soil here and losing this sense of connections, and those who work here. So uh, what can be done to mitigate this gap and maybe what other connecting factors? Look, I do think that artists who are abroad, uh, I mean, they cannot be disconnected from, from Ukraine, right? In their work, in their actions. Uh, I do think this is very important. As I always say that uh, the biggest Ukrainian profession uh, that we all share is to be a citizen of Ukraine or to be just human beings who are just, you know, chose this way of engaging um and, and there are very different ways of engaging. And look, I do think that talking to international colleagues, I do think that if they're smart, they really understand that uh, this gives a, 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 a big value added. I don't, I mean, I don't mean just that the idea of engaged, uh, engaged art or engaged culture when uh, when you know Ukrainian artists are volunteers or on the front line or whatever, not only this, but the idea that there is something more, there is something that goes beyond uh, just uh, just the question of style or the, the question of expression. I do think that um, from my experience of talking to and, and communicating with famous foreign writers or researchers or philosophers, they lack something that we have. Uh, and, and this lack is, they kind of feel themselves floating in the air, a little bit groundless. And when I see foreign writers coming to Ukraine, I recently I had a very good conversation with one Dutch writer who is Yaps Holt in his name and who is just bringing cars for Ukrainian military and he's a writer and he just discovered this need together with other writers from the Netherlands to come to Ukraine to donate to collect money for uh, to buy cars and I do think that the, the the thing that they're looking for is not only empathy to Ukrainians or sympathy to our struggle but also kind of a sense and meaning something in Ukraine, this struggle gives also them a little bit of more meaning of, of what they're doing. Because sometimes I see the, the, the art uh, or aesthetics in other countries and uh, which, which do not come through this existential struggle. And uh, I see kind of a, 
devaluation of senses there, devaluation of meaning. Mm, maybe because, maybe because you know, when you when you're seeking just art for art, or uh, it doesn't really work. It's an illusion that you can do art for art or culture for culture. It's it's always you need to say something to the society. You need to to give something to the society and to mm, and to other people, just other other people. So coming back to the question of values, uh, I, I do think that it's it's not even the question which values, because values can be different, right? Uh, you can you can meet an artist that has religious values. You can meet an artist that has conservative values. You can meet an artist that has very leftist values, etc. What is important is the belief in values. This is what really present among Ukrainian writers and, and intellectuals and artists. And this is some sometimes it is lacking in in other parts of the world, which which do not go through this existential struggle. And therefore, we had in the, in the past decades kind of a this expansion of cynicism and uh, the cynical reason, as as uh, as Sloterdijk would say. And I do think that our struggle is also the struggle against this cynicism. And um, maybe just return of the of the true things. Voldemar, thank you, thank you on that. Uh, while we have you know this discussion based on the research, we are also uh, in the framework of solutions. So I guess yeah, Aleftina, I'd like to come back to your point because I actually really do value it a lot, and it's maybe the store the solution education. I'd like to to expand on that. Yeah, and actually, um, I I was listening to you, Vladimir, and you was you you just told that it's you don't notice so much disconnection between uh, uh, people you do actually communicate, but in this research, maybe it's actually generation uh, matter. There are young artists who really couldn't manage the things going to Ukraine and back. Maybe it's again that for them it was more difficult and uh, they also couldn't manage with uh, having so many resources to be between two countries or between Ukraine and someone else. So, and they do complain really. And I just went through this paper and I also found out it's so much not about me because I don't feel this disconnecting moments, but they do answer like this. And yes, I think um, it could be educational platforms where the artists who are actually in Ukraine decided to speak be over here and who decided to be abroad, not decided, but sometimes forced and everyone has different condition and um, really like situation which could be better for them and everyone can decide for themselves. And uh, this, yes, I think it could be platform where not really education, maybe to share experiences. Maybe now we found out more better word share experiences and since i'm really dealing with this for from 2014 i remember that for me it was so much important to have a connection with my mom who was living in an occupied territory and i always said to myself i have to talk to her because if we meet when the war is over how we can talk and this is a metaphor for the artists who stay in Ukraine and artists who left Ukraine. And of course, they have very hard life abroad. And it's still, I think, we both and mainly the people who left Ukraine have to find energy and resources to um, really try to find the way to share the experiences. And if now we talk to institutions abroad, I would recommend if they to produce projects, mix artists from different situation, I would say. And of course there is sort categories. I do belong to this category. I do travel like two weeks I'm in Ukraine, two weeks I'm abroad. 
Yes, of course, sometimes it's really so hard to put the things together. And it's all the time you're in this situation being a bit uh, kind of poisoned by a free of peaceful life. And then you go to Ukraine and something else. And I all actually find a lot of experiences and also inspiration in it. Because all the time to see both context i would say but uh, in this paper it's so much about that sometimes institutions abroad actually can't understand this uh, type of uh, context and me as an artist sometimes try to explain in different workshops or performances or in drawings even to explain the different differences of context and now I understand that the most important thing that for the communication with institution abroad it's really like so much about context which is pretty specific in Ukraine and pretty pretty original in the sense that sometimes they do read a lot of uh, newspapers, see podcasts, uh, try to follow through the journalists, but they can't understand very simple things. For instance, the questions people ask me, do I pay tax? Do restaurants work? These kind of things. And it is so much important because if they do know more, they can actually communicate with uh, artists from Ukraine who left or still do uh, stay in Ukraine I can't say better quality. I think it's just really like would become active listening and it be become kind of adult um, collaboration when we both can learn from each other. What I mean, because Ukrainians became very, very sustainable. Sometimes when I see some people who have a power bank, which is not charged, I'm laughing because Ukrainians can really help with all the skills also, not only institutions abroad can give us something. I'm really talking about sharing and it's so much about active listening when the collaboration could be more about to listen to each other. This would be my um, actually uh, overview on paper and uh, the last uh, chapter in this paper, solutions. Yeah, yeah. That's actually a great point. Uh, and uh, following up on listening, uh, Katerina, I've listened to your one of your interviews uh, in the podcast. Uh, while preparing the discussion, and this also follows up on what Alevdina have mentioned, where you have been asked about the sustainability of musical life in Lithuania, and you know how this uh, the composer composers how is this called this institution Spilka Compositori, I'm sorry, sorry, I'll say that in Ukrainian. How composer Union. Yeah. yeah, Composer Union. Thank you for that. And we also see in this document that there is uh, this need for sustainable institutional development. So maybe you can refer to your experience and share how it's done in Lithuania and what can we do more and what can European institutions do also to support this cooperation more. Actually, in frame of uh, local cooperation, uh, local sustainability, uh, it's uh, realized in several levels. And definitely it started from the uh, school level, for instance, to develop uh, contemporary music uh, composer. Uh, even in uh, music schools, there is a possibility to uh, choose to be a, a composer and to, to deal with electronic music, for instance. And then based on this, the composer union actually is a uh, institution that try to uh, to collect as an umbrella that the, uh, the all smaller uh, institution or institution from different levels, as I said, from uh, music schools to uh, music academy, and also collect this context with international institution uh, at first uh, in Baltic countries, at Baltic and Nordic country, and, uh, at, and then of 
for all international countries as well. Uh, so uh, I, I like this idea how it works, like uh, like it, as I said, as an umbrella, and how it try to cover the different uh, levels uh, of uh, and different target audience that could be um, uh, could uh, could be relevant for them. Uh, in case with other cooperation, for for instance, it for it their first cooperation with international creator, uh, and uh, definitely the first with the Ukrainian ones. But still, uh, I like the idea that they uh, at the start they work. Uh, they decided to work not for one times and uh, launching the cooperation for three years minimum uh, to to develop this uh, in, in different stages and uh, even if they have the event only once a year uh, they try also to see how to collaborate in different levels uh, during these events. So it's also the, uh, about sustainability. And I could also uh, add the, uh, my own experience, for instance, with uh, when I launched the festival the first time uh, we had, uh, it, it was uh, really difficult because it's a new country for me and new context. But at the first place, uh, I organized a panel discussion and for the first festival, we uh, discuss our common values, common ideas, and where we could collaborate. On the second festival, we already uh, have uh, master classes and workshops uh, together with uh, Lithuanian and Ukrainian uh, representatives uh, and also joint concerts. And on the third festival that will be uh, next year, we actually apply for the big uh, international grant opportunity so to uh, organize a bigger event that we even uh, did that before so it's you usually it's take time and it's step by step process but uh, it's really worth it thanks you know that actually if you might have mentioned the point that you have stated they address a lot of the solution part that we have in this uh, document so uh, that's quite interesting. I think Volodymyr has left us because he has to run for his other event and we thank him for his contribution. I'd also like to remind the listeners once again to ask your question in the chat box alongside the screen. And after Anton, uh, please uh, be... Uh, Please know that I've also read some of your interviews while preparing, but I also found like the old ones, but there is a good point also corresponding to this uh, strategy document. Uh, it's an interview from 2000, 2017 when you, where you say that uh, a lot of choreographers, they uh, know little to zero regarding the modern art and the contemporary dance and uh, that there is a clear need for them to develop and orient on this international relations and be uh, in the broad to know the broader perspective of the modern art field and i think this is one of the like pending issues what we also have to develop further our relationships and the document addresses that can you maybe expand on that i think your perspective will be very valuable uh, yeah yes uh, that's still uh, that's still uh, uh, the same thing that uh, uh, the same i think now that uh, the the specific of contemporary dance uh, especially in ukraine is that it doesn't have mostly doesn't have any connection to another art form so it's not integrated in the kind of general contemporary art field let's say just let's say last few years which is very strange like last maybe five years the ukrainian choreographers started working with composers which is very strange yeah because yeah that's much easier to take the music which already has been made uh, years ago or found it somewhere in the internet and didn't ask anybody just use it there's absolutely another thing to find somebody to talk with the composer to write the things because that but it also needs to have this specific ability and knowledge about having conversation with the people from another art field 
to find the you know the translation between the art forms how to translate what you want to do and how how you can collaborate and that's not only about music that's about everything but visual art connected with dance i don't know with video art with digital me whatever and uh, that's also clear that this problem starts from the education because uh, the, and this education problem starts from the Soviet Union education, where when people were uh, learning dance in the universities, wherever they were learning how to dance, how to make movements, or how to create movements. You you take in music and then you you develop some choreographic languages. But that is this is very you know literally a way how to translate your ideas into language mostly like in the bali but contemporary art and contemporary dance in general works absolutely in in the world let's say in europe in the us uh, works with absolutely different ideas much more abstract much more um, whatever and um then again coming back to education and to professional development uh, I think many many of the choreographers uh, who kind of well known in Ukraine and uh, well developed and kind of educated when they go abroad that apparently appears that they are not at all in the same level with the European. I mean the the way of thinking about the the way of developing ideas, the way of thinking about the piece, about the topic, and the way of the research is absolutely different. And um, the, this, this, that's why I think, and this is also the role of our institution, what we do now and what we, we do our best to keep this connection with the choreographers who now uh, working and studying and uh, practicing whatever doing abroad, uh, working with different institutions, different organizations. At the, at the beginning of the war, when many of them left Ukraine, our role was more to help them to find these connections because we as an organization are a member of many European networks. So for us, it was easier when when we knew that okay you are there in this country in this city so you can go there there and then find maybe some support we started from this and now we at the, another stage of this thing like trying to get the feedback from these people what they learned what they saw what they practiced what they participated in what how the uh, how the perspectives changed and they changed a lot i already saw people who i think they mostly decided to stop working in choreography and dance and do something else because they understood that what they did before that's something different that's they the, the experience that they had they couldn't use it in the new environment and or if they want to use it in this new environment, European environment, they need to re re-educate themselves. And this is the this step takes a lot of energy and work, and uh, not even everybody, especially when you kind of middle-aged choreographer and when we say about choreography like 30 years old is already middle-aged choreographer because when you're 40 or 45 you already finished <laughs> yeah so when you're middle-aged it's already difficult to re re-educate yourself for youngers is is easier thank yeah. you and did i answer your question yes yeah. yes yes and it also uh, I was not asking this, but uh, there is also one point from the document I remember is this, uh, the solution that is proposed is to develop a lot of platforms for Ukrainian and foreign uh, artists and mainly artists in the field of contemporary dance uh, 
to you know to bring up this cooperation to intensify the knowledge exchange and thought exchange and i think that's what you're also speaking about that we need more of these platforms tools uh, and so on uh, uh and the first and the first yeah, and yeah. the most important when you do it you need to find this language the common language when people from the different context different environments can find the the way how they can talk and how they can collaborate and create something together and this is much more different than to develop any platform i can develop platforms every month you know but who will come there and what they will yeah, be doing yeah there. yeah what is the substance <laughs> that, right yeah yeah Alethina, I'll read an extract from the document, just one sentence. A common goal and a territory for consensus between Ukraine's cultural institutions and actors is the impossibility of interaction with Russian cultural agents. I know a lot about your work uh, and your research that you have also done, I think, with Alona Karavai, and I would like you to... Or, uh, expand on that and uh, address this topic. Yeah, it's in one uh, chapter, it's actually, actually, as you said, in the end, there is this topic. And uh, maybe some international institution would think it's not important, but it's so much important because after a year, after the whole scale invasion of Russia to Ukraine took place, Alona Karavai and I, we decided to look what is happening in the moment, because in the first days of the whole scale invasion, some artists, many from different sphere, they reacted exactly the same. They said, no, we can't be with actually a Russian artist on the round table in the same program, in the same project, in the same exhibition, whatever. And actually, after a year, we created questionnaire with many questions, like 20. And one of the questions was, of course, about uh, have you had the situation when you were invited to be with Russian artist? And uh, actually, 84 percentage answers were yes. And then the next question was, what did you do? And I would say only 3 percentage of all artists said that we didn't do anything. So basically, most of the Ukrainian artists try to do something with this. They try really to negotiate with uh, organizers, mostly these international institutions, and the result is not they expected. Most of the, their attempts are failed. I would say like we actually found out that actually only like 15 percentage of all uh, people who actually took part in our questionnaire answered that they could do something. The more of the people tried and couldn't and they stepped out. And the, the result of our questionnaire is such a set. And it's interesting that um, most of the Ukrainian artists stepped out from the projects where Russians were present. Secondly, some of Ukrainian artists who noticed open calls where it also could be possible that Russians would be there, they even didn't apply. One of the questions we asked it was about that, do you aware of what you lose? And they do aware. Most of the answers, they answered that we lost networking professional connections. Second, of course, money. Third, opportunity to produce uh, their statements related to Ukraine and also their careers. And the question why you couldn't be with Russian artists, the answer is emotional condition. Second, also ethic. They said that it's unfair. They explain in many ways. And after a year and a half, we understood that cancel Russian culture didn't happen. And we basically received that, unfortunately, Ukrainians are losing their opportunities to be present on international art sphere. And one more question we also put, when you 
try to communicate with your organizers about this question. What the dynamic, what, what the attitude you noticed? And some uh, actually answers were that organizers became even cold and they didn't understand Ukrainian artists. I would say that basically it's our internal problem and also external problem as well. And again, about solutions. Maybe I'm too fast, sorry. <laughs> Not really to talk about the paper, but to talking about the solutions. Uh, to my opinion, that there are two aspects. First of all, in Europe and also in US, I would say our partners, which is really partners, they don't understand where is actually the danger. Really, they don't, I would say. They don't understand language, they don't understand the narrative, they don't understand what kind of works all these Russian artists could be involved. For instance, I have example that one individual artist which could, for instance, apply for the funds from the Ministry of the Netherlands, I mean, on culture. And for instance, he took part in the Wagner Center. For instance, this the uh, actually one of the points. And of course, the Ministry of uh, Culture in the Netherlands couldn't recognize what is the Wagner Center. He probably did it in uh, Russian only, not in English. And second, also not uh, so much clearness about that uh, the problem with our Russian-Ukrainian war is not only about one man who is Putin, it's so much about imperialistic war. And uh, the imperialistic uh, uh, mindset and opinion so much basically implemented in literature and art even, and in culture. And since there were not so many researchers or good researchers, I mean, very like Eva Thompson or something like this, who could really point where and why um, culture of Russia is really connected to the situation of our everyday life now and to this war. And uh, there is this gap, which unfortunately Ukrainians or Ukrainian artists, me personally, try to really like to fix this gap, but it's a lot of work. For instance, I remember my performance where explaining what is the problem with Chekhov. It was was my performance, or something else, you know. Or I to draw a lot of drawings where I explain what's the problem. But it's like this job has to be done when actually all the empires were falling apart, but Russia didn't. It's already like from 60s, I would say, or 70s. So, and to conclude, not to be so long, I would say, unfortunately, Ukrainian artists, when they see Russian participants or Russian people, even in a staff, they step out. And before we talked so much about how to make Ukrainian artists to be more educated, to have more social skills, to implement their practice and their projects. But we haven't discussed this point. If there would be versions over there, most of the Ukrainian artists would be not working in this project, unfortunately. Austin, oh, thank you. And I'd maybe even encourage uh, our listeners to, I think they can find this research you have done, or maybe you'll just publish it on your Facebook page so then they can uh, take a look into it because it's really interesting and valuable material, at least maybe some results that can be for public. Uh, uh, you know, the strategy, they say the strategy is a dynamic document, and I actually think this strategy is quite dynamic. So maybe let's keep this discussion also dynamic. Uh, we have a lot of Q&A questions, and I uh, would propose this format of two-minute answers, kind of blitz one. Uh, so sorry if I interrupt you. I'm not rude. I'm just well organized. Kidding. So the first question is, uh, it's actually from Simon. And the question is, what I, I will repeat if you have a need for that. And the question is, what might be the impact on the next generation of artists of having their heroes or leaders based outside of the country? And how to address this 
issue. So basically, what, how will it impact this generation of artists and how to address this? Katerina. Give me two minutes to think <laughs> about. On? Uh, uh, I just said, give me two minutes to think about it. It's an ah, interesting right. question. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, Anton, can you go with that? I would say it, it's, a, it's a hard question. There, for many years, it was uh, we, we've been living in a situation when people who came from, from abroad was mostly uh, uh, leaders, you know, like if you go from there and if you have this uh, European or whatever else education, that means that there's something like a quality and you bring something really much more important that, that we have here. But I, I don't know what will happen next in our situation when uh, the war will be finished. It's uh, it's very much uh, very much depend in which in which situation we will find ourselves after it will be finished. Who will be the who will be the leaders in the I don't know are they still be living and working in Ukraine or they will be traveling back and forth or I think we we going uh, toward the more more you know traveling and. Um, multi uh how to say multi cultural understanding of the uh, leadership so people who travel more and who see more and maybe even if they based abroad they of course they could be the leaders I if, think, if I the think... local community local ukrainian communities would trust them I think what the issue is, it's, you know, that's what Aleftina said. That's regarding the leaders from Ukraine. For example, Aleftina is here in Ukraine. She's physical and everyone can touch her and ask her these questions, like stupid questions. How do you do that? How do you do that? So, but with, with like some Ukrainian artists leaving, uh, I think the question is stored that Aleftina, what should we do with uh, artists, uh, leaving and how will it influence their current leaders current artists oh I, my answer is that actually this is the task and i believe that ukrainian artists would do this they do leave or they stay i think our situation our war also our revolution of dignity where we really were fighting for the more freedom for democratic values. I know that some people from Africa don't like to hear European or Western values. They don't like it. And I think Ukrainians have to be really champions or heroes of empathy. This war made me really like start to understand so many small communities, nations. I think we have to really like be really people who suffered from this war. We have such a big country, I would say, 42 million, the biggest country in Europe, bigger than France. And we received this war and we have such a rich uh, culture, which was not known, unfortunately. We have really like amazing heritage, which is not known. And I think from one hand, we never were in the center we have a lot of talk. We really like went through such a hard transformation. We are so actually skilled to do revolutions, to be mobilized. If to look what happened two years ago, like even babushka salt ladies could really like fight with drones and uh, like uh, artists produce posters, many things and went to front line. I think we, or any Ukrainian artists as the heroes, they have to unite all people over the world. Everything that we do have, we struggle. It's not our problem. It's the problem of whole planet. Imperialistic story, it's part of our human civilization, unfortunately. And the capitalistic issue as well. Sorry, yeah, thank you. Two minutes. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. The format. Katarina, you Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll just repeat so we can try to answer the question. So 
the next generation of Ukrainian artists, not having Ukrainian art leaders in Ukraine, but having them outside. Will it influence them and how to address this issue? Uh, I definitely think that it will influence and uh, it's difficult to predict in which way. I may say that we need these heroes and leaders now to be able to, to survive in the situations that we have. We really, as you said, need to understand how to do that uh, because it's a new situation. It's not normal situation. And when we see uh, heroes who could deal with it, it become easier for us. I really hope that our future generation will have uh, heroes and leaders definitely based on common values and maybe in this case if we choose it not geographically but in uh, values uh, wise it would be maybe less matter where this leader is uh, inside or outside the country and uh, but yeah definitely it would be nice to have both that's a good one. Thank you, Katerina. On to the round two. Uh, what should happen in Ukraine uh, or generally in the big whole world to bring artists, Ukrainian artists, especially the independent one, together? What more do we need? Uh, value, uh, impact? Can you address that? And how to organize that? how to bring independent art, independent artists together. And if you have maybe some good cases from your experience, share with that. Aleftina, can you start? Values, I would say. <laughs> I think it's so much about values. So I would say in the situation we have in Ukraine, when we have shellings or alerts each two hours, Art in Ukraine, it's only about values. You never would do art for any purpose, not even for commercial things. Like Antonio just mentioned, remember, we talked, of course, everyone has to think how to earn values. That's a great one, Anton. Um, it depends what you mean, how to uh, how to unite. Uh, I, I, I mean, that artist can be united uh, even living in different countries. Then, yes, values, of course, can unite them. Or you mean bring them all together in the same place. <laughs> this is another thing. And, when, and if we talk about uh, uh, contemporary dance field, which is quite big, that's only only choreographers know how many uh, of us are here in Ukraine, and uh, this is very much about uh, working conditions, because uh, there's such a huge gap and difference uh, in working conditions in Ukraine and abroad, and possibilities and uh, networking possibilities and infrastructure possibilities, everything. That's all, all uh, thing that happened in contemporary dance in Ukraine. It's all made on passion and, uh, you know, love to this thing. There's nothing from the, from the state, from government, from whatever else. It's all from, from, the, from the top, yeah, from the bottom, I mean. Katerina, uh, one more, th yeah. you know, this question, but you also <laughs> always get a tougher one. No, values. Yes, I agree the values, but, you know, values are a core thing, but also a broader thing. So how maybe do we share those values with the colleagues? How we, you know, go into more details? Do we need to strategize? Do we need to work together? What do we do to share these values? Actually, that's what I, I want to, uh, to say. So, yeah, uh, the common projects. Uh, the projects where they could work together on these values, etc. But uh, uh, as maybe long-lasting projects, uh, uh, sustainable project, it also could help. In this case, when we work together, it uh, it means that our different experience actually it's not divide us. It shows the uh, benefits and possibility of this different experience and in this case i think it's uh, much easier to uh, define these values develop it and uh, continue working in, in the future and aleftina with you know this uh, model that we currently have uh, this with the funding and commissioning 
does this uh, bring artists more to uh, you know be more competitive and separate and you know uh, put an elbow into each other's chest or or how do you evaluate that yeah uh, i try to be short once i made my own research on my uh, art practice I took uh, my masterpieces, which is like many people said, oh, it's great work, great work. Some of the works I did, as Anton said, from love, having nothing, no even money. Some works I received financial support and also made nice work. So it's so hard to say. I think with what uh, actually Katerina said, common projects. So it's always gifts. So the Big trees never in a desert. It's always in a garden, and then it really goes. And uh, I think it's like so much around that. As Anton said, it's, it's true. There is this gap between uh, Ukrainian artists and international in working condition. But if to look in the Africa, or for instance, to Latin America, sometimes it's maybe we should also include them. Then we feel, feel more natural situation or help to each other. I think, yes, common projects, but not only from Europe and US, but expand, expand. Ukrainians have to be leaders in this. We Anton, should. What, yes, thank you, Lieutenant. Anton, what's your take on that? Mm, I think I said already, yeah, but uh, the the when I say the working conditions, I also mean that the conditions when people sh may, may have the abilities to work on the same project, but that also means that they have the support, you know, because if there is no support, nothing would happen. And also then another important thing that, choreographers because they never had any support for years and years and years they used to find the uh, to to develop the ability of self organization to do everything with their own hands to arrange everything without anything you know to bring people together and then what was always important that other people or organization or the state shouldn't uh, I don't know how to say the uh, palkiv colors of Don't don't make a, uh, don't build fences. You know, just okay. give people the the freedom to do what they want to do. This is another important thing. But because I don't know what what will be after we will win the war. You know, right. Two two more, and we have to close. Uh, Katerina, Anton, and Leftina, please one example of your productive collaboration with artists or institutions abroad and why it was productive and why it was successful. Katerina, we start with you. I probably already mentioned during this uh, discussion, so definitely uh, Lithuanian Composer Union. I was invited as an artistic director for the oldest uh, experimental and contemporary music festival. Uh, it gave the possibility to bring uh, many Ukrainian uh, performers to this festival, uh, not just to showcase them and showcase our music, but also actually uh, to uh, make the collaboration with Ukrainian Lithuanian uh, musicians and composers and uh, uh, with other international composers. So I definitely think it's the um, most successful for now. And since it lasts for third festival, so probably Why was I, it I could consider what, it like what was, what was the secret to the success? Uh, what was the secret? Uh, uh, I don't know. I probably I, I really love what I do. It's actually for everyone, uh, and to just to love belief. And uh, it's uh, sorry, it's uh, more uh, the partnership it's approach. But in a partnership approach, I think try to do your best. Uh, definitely, okay. if something going wrong just pick up try to communicate it's usually happening the big project but you need to be very clear in your communication uh, uh establish uh long uh distance uh, relation uh, long relationship i mean uh, uh, sustainable and i in this i mean to 
write a memorandum, uh, do something that it will be not only, you know, it just saying the words, uh, organize a feedback system and then do something with this feedback system. It also helps. Um, yeah, and uh, definitely good. collaborate yeah. with, yeah, uh, yeah, collaborate, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Aleftina, I think you had tens and thousands of good one and also I think hundreds of bad one. So what distinguishes them and what is a secret to good collaboration? Can you briefly focus on that? Mm, recently, I actually uh, was a leader of play with the people with uh, uh, Liechtenstein or from Liechtenstein. So it was interesting that uh, I could organize all of them to read my play. And I understood that I really tried to help them to impress themselves. They are not so used to this. And the people who were between the calibration, one woman was a former broker in Hilti, which produced actually the building devices. I was so happy to actually work with this type of people. And you know what she said? When the war is over, I will come to rebuild your country. So that's, they said. That's an inspiring story. <laughs> and actually, recently, I also did teach in Saint Nazar School in Nantes. I was so pleased. So many students were so thankful to me. I even didn't know that I could bring a lot of experiences, knowledges, and voices. I was absolutely in new situation to be very welcomed by this institution and by the people. Thank you for that. Anton, what was your most successful collaboration maybe with institution and what was the recipe for success? Uh, on the institutional level, it's uh, uh, it's the collaboration with the Lithuanian Dance Information Center and the Lithuanian uh, Festival New Baltic Dance, which is our uh, partner since uh, 2014. And uh, since then, we've been collaborating every year. And uh, last year, first time, uh, I think first time in history of the <laughs> Ukrainian contemporary dance, we organized Ukrainian contemporary dance platform in Vilnius in the frame of the New Baltic Dance Festival, where we, we brought six Ukrainian performances just created after the beginning of the invasion and presented them. There were a lot of uh, communications and discussions and panels and a lot of presenters from all the Europe. So this was a very high point of our uh, collaborations. And on, on my personal level, which is kind of strange, but interesting, that's the, the most interesting collaborations with me uh, as an artist was with my friends and colleagues in the US. And what was, yeah, why was uh, it most successful? What was the approach from your colleagues? I don't know, you know, maybe this is a kind of very, very honest interest to what, what is really Ukrainian, I don't know, um, soul, Ukrainian context, everything, yes. And, and, um, and I think because that context is absolutely different, but this empathy and this wish to, to understand, to try something different, uh, was very clear always, and okay. and for me, it's always the very very much very important point to have the real interest to understand, to feel another person or another institution. Then we can create something together. Thank you. I think we have three minutes left, so maybe let's just dive into the closing remarks. And I would ask each of you to highlight maybe one point from the document that. Uh, you have separated for yourself or maybe the issue that was raised there and give us all after uh, with that give us uh, one advice how to build cultural relations and one advice how to fight this bad weather and uh, autumn depression let's do that <laughs> Catherine. Um, Catherine. So, Catherine. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh so, the highlight from the document. It's more important than the depression point. Okay, sure. 
uh, so the main uh, the main highlight from the document uh, le uh, let's say this collaboration project and sharing the experience uh, and uh, yeah use the international experience like uh, educational actually sources uh, doesn't matter if the international experience from uh, Ukrainians who are abroad or from international organization just uh, you know find the source uh, and it's I think it's really relevant what is the next question sorry the depression point the autumn depression, depression? Oh, the depression. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Have more of this uh, communication and networking meeting. Uh, yes, but, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, really help and especially help in offline, but still online. I think it's really re relevant. Thank you. Anton, up to, on to you. Uh, all the best uh, project which happened in my life, the collaboration project, was always based on the relationships between human, not between the organizations. Like this is that something kind of love should happen. That's always started from you met somebody, you felt like, oh, this is the right person you, you want to be a friend with. And then you become a friend. And then from this point, you start to develop something as an, an, on, on the level of the institution. It's never happened in, the, in another order, you know, like from institutional to human in my life. Okay. So being human and, and understand yourself as a human and trying to understand another person as a human is the critical point for me. And uh, in terms of the uh, in, in terms of the uh, autumn depression, for me, it's always the same answer: uh, just move. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it dance or not dance, but you should move. As soon as you have power and energy to walk, to run, to I don't know, make something with your hands, okay. you can get your depression away. <laughs> Thank you, Anton. Alethina, the point from the strategy and the point on autumn, autumn bad mood. Yeah, yeah, actually, I opened the paper, and actually, in the paper, what I really like found very interesting. So it was description about uh, Ukrainians. I mean, artists, and it was used this word patchwork, that uh, all artists in Ukraine are so different. So you can't say that it's monolith. They're all the same. And I, I like it. I think I would say as an advice, don't stereotype Ukrainians. If you meet one Ukrainian who is like uh, Anton said, like doing very kind of not uh, contemporary dance, but there would be the other one, classical dancing or something like this. We are very, very diverse and different, different experiences. And I think it's good uh, part of Ukrainians. We are not uh, actually uh, alike and we like that we are different. And uh, and I think it's uh, part of the, I would say, and the stable system. And the depression? Say again? And the depression? What do we do with the depression? <laughs> what kind of depression? I don't understand what is depression. Oh, how to... Oh, irony. Yeah, irony. Yeah, irony. irony. That works. Yes, my, or humor. My, or yeah. humor. Better, better, uh, better to do uh, humoristic things about even yourself. And then you I... never a victim. <laughs> then you never a victim. When you can have a distance, which is irony, uh, gives or make your own humor about yourself you're never a victim because it's always needs a distance and while i also give my favorite point from the strategy it's to stimulate fellowship and scholarships and my another observations is that the points all the speakers have mentioned regarding fighting the depression are actually also a good tool to stimulate the cultural development in ukraine and build the more sustainable strategy uh, I'd all thank the panelists. I'd also thank the team of the uh, SADOS and the Ukrainian uh, Institute for developing the strategy. That's an amazing document. I encourage everyone to find it on the website and read once again. Thank you, Anton. Thank you, Oleftina. Thank you, Katerina, for smiling. And thank you, Simon, and the whole ArtsLink community. Uh, and on to you, Simon. Thank you for that. 
No, Hanat, I just wanted to thank you for being this uh, conductor of this very complex orchestra of uh, extraordinary artists. So yeah, Anton, Aleftina, uh, Katerina, thank you so much for sharing both your thinking, but also this extraordinary uh, expertise you've evolved over many years. Uh, and Hanat, thank you uh, for keeping us all not only in order, but uh, as, as focused as we can be in such a context. Um, and thank you for enduring the outages of Wi-Fi and all the, uh, the problems of trying to have this kind of conversation online. So for me, it's clear we all need to be in Lviv next year. Uh, we will see you all in person. Uh, I'm in Lviv now. <laughs> so we'll be at the Jam Factory. We have to make it happen. It's a, a dream, but I uh, hope to see you all there. Thank you, everyone uh, who's been watching online. Uh, as as uh, Hanat said, uh, the document is available both in Ukrainian and English. Uh, it's 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 short but very uh, focused. So please read it, and we'd be very happy to get your uh, comments, your thoughts uh, from from your uh, sense of the document. And we'll be working on it both with our artist colleagues, with our alums, and uh, with uh, the the cultural community in Ukraine. We look forward to lots more work to come, and to see you all soon. Hanat, thank you, uh, thank you all for joining us. Thanks to everyone. Have a nice day. Have a nice evening. You too. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam.